Hello and welcome to this short introduction to dimensionality reduction. This video is designed to explain the basics of dimensionality reduction by explaining what we mean when we describe dimensionality reduction as the construction of an isometry between some high dimensional and some low dimensional space. Let's start by considering the usual process of creating collective variables to analyze molecular dynamics trajectories. The trajectory will consist of a set of trajectory frames. Each of these frames describes the positions of all the atoms in the system and can be thought of as a three n-dimensional vector where n is the number of atoms. The collective variables that we work with for the most part of the time are then functions that take this high dimensional vector, transform it in some way and output a number, a point on the real axis as illustrated in this diagram. Let's look at this process in a slightly different way. In this figure, we have a schematic illustration of the domain, the set of atomic configurations that the system can adopt, and the codomain, the set of values that the collective variable can have, for our collective variable function. Every point in the domain, every configuration the system can adopt, maps onto a point in the codomain, a value for the collective variable. The problem, as illustrated here, is that this function is many to one. As such, it may well be that two markedly different configurations of the system have the same value for the collective variable. In many dimensionality reductions, the solution that is proposed to this problem is to forego this attempt to map the entire domain onto a codomain. In other words, one no longer looks for a function that can take in any configuration of atoms and output a value for the collective variables. Instead, a set of representative configurations is found, and a set of projections of these configurations is generated in a lower dimensional space, as illustrated here. If you think about this, we have seen ideas like this before. Consider a, tr a transition between these two configurations of a protein. Now imagine that I tell you that in undertaking these conformation and transition, the system has to pass through these two intermediate states. We can label the first of these configurations with the number 1, thereby indicating that this is the first structure that will be encountered during the transition. Similarly, we can label the second of these configurations with the number 2, and indicate that this is the second structure encountered. We can continue this process and label the third configuration 3 and the fourth configuration 4. We in fact do this naturally with our talk of first, second, third and fourth. If you think about what we have done here, we have taken each of our configurations, each 3n dimensional vector of top atom positions, and mapped them onto a point in the real number line. In other words, we have done some dimensionality reduction. What is more, it was relatively painless. Let's now look at doing this in two dimensions. Just as with our previous example with the path, we have a set of four atomic configurations and a set of four projections. We then have a one-to-one -one mapping between the atomic configurations and the projections. Hence, this top configuration here corresponds to this projection. This second configuration is projected here. The third projection is projected over here. And the fourth projection is projected down here. The problem is, is that there is an infinite different number of ways of arranging the various projections. For instance, one could arrange them in the way shown, like this like this, or like this, or even like this. Our salvation comes when we recognize that we can take any two trajectory frames and calculate the distance between them using Pythagoras theorem. The distance we measure tells us the total amount by which we have to move all the atoms in order to get from configuration A to configuration B, and is obviously a single number. As such, if we have multiple frames, we can construct a matrix of distances, like the one shown here. We can then use these distances in the construction of projections by requiring that the distance between the projections of two particular frames is the same as the distance between the two high-dimensional configurations. Let's consider how this should be done with the matrix of distances shown here. We can take the projection of the first frame and put it in the centre of the page. Once we have done this, we know that the second point must be somewhere on a circle of radius d12 centred on this first point. It must be on the circumference of this circle because we want the distance between the projection of the first frame and the second frame to be equal to d12. 
only the points on the circumference of this circle satisfy this constraint. For the time being, let's place the projection of the second frame here and move on to the third point. This point must lie on the circumference of this circle of radius d13, as it has to be exactly d13 centimetres from point 1. Similarly, though, it must also be on this circle of radius d23, as it must be within d23 of the projection of the second frame. As you can see from the figure, there are only two points in the whole of the low dimensional space that are able to satisfy these two constraints simultaneously. We will choose to put our projection on this particular solution of the, to the problem, and we'll move on to the fourth and final point. This point must lie on this circle of radius d14, and on this circle of radius d24 for all the reasons that we now know so well. On top of this, it must be exactly d34 centimetres from the projection of frame 3. One of the two points where the d14 and d24 circles cross will almost certainly satisfy this last constraint better, and so we should project the fourth point in this location. In practice, we do not find the projections in the sequential manner I have just described. What we do instead is introduce a stress function that measures the distance between each pair of trajectory frames and the distance between each pair of their corresponding projections and sums up the squares of all these quantities as shown here. Distances always being calculated using Pythagoras theorem. We calculate this, uh, this quantity when we have the projections here say and find it is quite high. We thus move the projections, recalculate the distances between the pairs of projections, and see if the stress is lowered. By repeating this process, or by using an optimization algorithm, we can eventually find the set of projections which most closely reproduces the distances between the atomic configurations.